Hello, with me today I have Dr. John McDade, who teaches theology in St. Mary's University College in Twickenham, just outside London. And he is going to look at the topic of cruelty and Nietzsche. John, why study Nietzsche and cruelty? Because I think Nietzsche was fascinated by cruelty. Um, one of the things he's, he, he puts forward is that there's a real puzzle about how the human animal, that's his phrase, how the human animal gains the capacity to make promises and to take responsibility for its existence. How does it develop a selfhood, in other words? He notices that most of our life passes without our conscious attention. So our digestive system, our heart, all the organs of the body happen without any operation of the mind or the, or the conscious selfhood in relation to it. Um, but there's something very unusual, he says, about the fact that we have the capacity to develop a selfhood and also the capacity to turn against that selfhood in a kind of internal division. Now, at this point you can see, well, Nietzsche's he's being philosophical, but he's also moving into the territory of psychology. And one of the things he proposes is that what really seals the person, what makes the person uh, a self-aware person, is the experience of pain. Because he points out that it's the, it's the things that really hurt us that become deeply scarred and, and, and embedded in the self. So I, I think from this kind of almost thing that he notices about himself, he extends this to a kind of idea that somehow the self, the person and culture have as their source and their root some kind of engagement with pain, cruelty and suffering. And one of his, uh, one of his suggestions is that bloodletting, killing, cruelty lies at the heart of every culture. And most cultures would not acknowledge this because we get beyond this. But in terms of what he calls a genealogy of culture, a genealogy, an account of the how human society develops, mm -hmm. he places a great deal of importance on the phenomenon of cruelty and pain lying at the heart of what binds a society together. Which is why, for example, religion comes to be enormously important at the, at the heart of culture because Nietzsche sees a connection between the instinct for cruelty, self-division and religion. So he thinks that the human nature, human beings, are instinctively religious, but he doesn't understand by this that there is this movement in us towards truth and love. For him, religion and the religious instinct is an aspect of the way in which we're divided against ourselves and turn against ourselves in punitive, self-punishing ways. And again, you can see I suspect there's some kind of um, personal reflection on Nietzsche's part because I think his experience of Christianity was of a particularly strong, punitive, self-hating type. And uh, a lot of his hatred of Christianity comes from his, his rejection of that way of being himself or, or that kind of anthropology. He just thought that this was a disastrous message uh, to communicate to people. And in one of, the, one of his writings, he has a, a particularly strong and, and very clear outline that um, when I first read it, it just took my breath away. He, he describes what he calls the ladder of religious cruelty. And he says there are three rungs on that ladder. And the first rung on the ladder is where in early human society, human beings sacrificed to God what was most important, what was dearest to them. And he points, for example, to the, the parts of the Jewish scriptures where Abraham is commanded by God to sacrifice Isaac. And, and there's no doubt that, that in the culture of the Middle East at the time, it was a relatively common thing in, in the surrounding cultures to sacrifice the firstborn son yeah. as an offering to God. And, um, and he also lists some of the aspects of cruelty associated with some of the Roman emperors. So he, he extends this to a kind of both, both Jewish, Christian and also um, the pagan classical world, that this is the point at which there is religious cruelty and it involves the physical killing of what is most dear to us. 
and, and in a sense the, the implication is by destroying our children we are actually punishing ourselves. Mm. At the second level of this uh, he then goes on to describe what he calls the second rung and this would be where instead of engaging in this horrifying brutalizing killing of, of what is most dear to us um, we, we offer to God the instincts within the self. So it's the period of asceticism, the period of self-discipline, the period where, uh, for example, instead of marrying and having a family, we live lives of being unmarried celibates, for example. And we exercise a whole asceticism with regard to our nature, our instincts, the emotions and the, the drives within us. And these are the things that are sacrificed to God spiritually. And again for him, this is a way of turning against the self. So it's not a fulfillment. He's very suspicious of these, these religious movements of spiritual self-sacrifice and asceticism. And then what I mentioned, this took my breath away, the third stage of religious cruelty, the third rung on the ladder, is when we become atheists. And he's got this astonishing description that, that atheism is in fact the culmination of this religious instinct. Because by denying ourselves belief in God's existence, but by denying ourselves the belief that there is a goodness at the heart of reality, uh, that there is a possibility of justice and the resolution of, of all the injustices in the world in some kind of cosmic harmony, it eventually resolves the dilemmas of existence. We deny ourselves this, so we turn against God, who is in fact the only possibility of our having and experiencing a meaning in terms of goodness and justice and love and truth. And he says we sacrifice this for the nothing. So the move into nihilism, which he sees to be at the heart of the, the atheist denial, is for him the culmination of the whole process of religious cruelty that goes through right from early history. Now I know of no other writer who presents the atheist step uh, as the culmination of the religious step. And that seems to me a remarkable insight that he connects the move into the self-denial of atheism as the culmination of what it means to be religious as a person. And it's this association of, of religious sacrifice with atheistic sacrifice, mm. uh, disclosing, as Nietzsche holds, um, disclosing that at the heart of our reality is simply nothingness and emptiness and that all our attempts to construct meaning are somehow fantasies with which we, we fill this void. But the human animal deep down is, 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 is haunted by the, the, the inability to face up to the emptiness within and, and it's also filled with a desire to turn against itself mm. in a kind of pattern of destruction and, and ruination both uh, religiously and also atheistically. In a sense, actually, this what he, he he's expressing this this self hatred. In many ways, is is the same experience that stands behind what many theologians have called original sin. Yes, yes, yes. Some kind of radical flaw. I mean, one one modern writer has described uh, Nietzsche and Freud and and Marx to some extent as secular theologians of original sin. If you look at Freud's writings too, Freud, Freud posits that at the heart of early human culture is the killing of the father by the sons. And that the, the memory of this is repressed in the human psyche. Uh, and, and constantly human beings are, are feel obliged to, to, to venerate the father who has died, but also to approach that father with a certain amount of fear. And for Freud, religion comes from, it's, it's like a, a, a return of the repressed memory in a, in a hidden form. But of course at the heart of human history, says Freud, is this act of patricide, the killing of the father. A secular version of original sin, if you like. And do you see this secular version of original sin as, sort of, as forming some sort of a, a backdrop against which Christian theologians sh should do their, their theologizing? Well, it's interesting. I mean, I, I, I tend to think that um, we should never think that um, explaining the complexity of humanness is easy. Hmm. 
and we possibly need multiple accounts of ourselves and, and multiple versions of, of our problematic. Um, in, 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 a, in a strange way, it's easier to speak about God because we have rules for how our language might apply to God than it is to speak about human beings because I think we need multiple descriptions and I think we're a great puzzle to ourselves and I think the work of Nietzsche, the kind of ideas he, he touches on and it seems to me to resonate with, uh, with, with something in us and, and Freud too, these are people who are exploring the dark side of identity dark side of culture and um, I think as, as a Christian theologian I, I want to engage with that and to be attentive to these if you like modern myths. Mm. Freud's account for example is very mythical and you could say well in its own way Nietzsche's ladder of, of religious cruelty is mythical. It's a way of organizing reality historically but also to to cast some kind of light upon dimensions of the self and impulses within us that we would have difficulty uh, dealing with in other ways. So I, I think a, uh, an engagement with this is astonishingly interesting. John, thank you very much for exploring this darker side of our identity that we can, and in a sense, bringing to our attention something that we tend to ignore. Thank you.